Jonathan Baker. We love you. We're going to have a feature tonight. Don't run me, Ben. He's been here before. He's been around for a while. We like you. But what's his name? What's his name? We love him. We love him. He's got a couple books. Yeah. Oh, is he going to actually show them? Take him up then. Oh, we like to really hop people's stuff. He has a couple books out. His latest is, which I can sort of have a hard time telling the word pronouncing. Homo, homo, how do you come up here and talk okay, about it? So yeah. See, I try to get out of those things. But he also has his books are probably for sale. He also has the one, The Great American Scapegoat. This here for Tony Brewer. Commercial for me. It's uh, homunculus. Homunculus. Okay. So it's homunculus. It's hot type cold read. Uh, I think those are the only two I have on me tonight. So uh, I'm doing some. Uh, I'm going to do. I'm going to do some special material tonight. If that's okay with you. Yeah. How you guys doing out there? The snow is. Um, not entirely unexpected, but it's uh, it's going to make the drive home interesting, most likely. And yeah, there's probably like half a foot on the ground. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do tonight is uh, uh, working with a, an audio festival, uh, audio art festival in June, and I'm doing a special program uh, to commemorate Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who uh, passed away at the age of 101 back in February. He was like just weeks shy of his 102nd birthday. And so, uh, I'm gonna do some, some Fairland Getty poems tonight, but I wanna do some special Fairland Getty poems tonight. Because... So Lawrence Fairland Getty, you know Lawrence Fairland Getty. He's already been, some of his name has already been, he's already been invoked, I think Bill uh, mentioned him in, in earlier. I think maybe Tim did too. He's, He's really well known. He was he wasn't really a beat. He was before the beats. He, he published the beats. Uh, he published Howl. He went to trial. Uh, he went to court uh, with the obscenity trials for Howl to, to get Howl published. So and now high school kids read Howl at open mics. It's amazing. Um, little known fact though, Lawrence Fairling Getty read in Indiana one time back in the year 2000. And uh, while he was here, he read at uh, Clues Hall in Indianapolis, and while he was here, he wrote a poem in his hotel room while he was here in Indiana, and he read it at that reading last night. Uh, he read it at that reading that night. Uh, I was in the audience. I wrote a response poem to that poem. And so part of what I'm going to do for this uh, festival later in June is braid the two poems together with some live music. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight, because I'm still kind of figuring out how to read these two poems, is I'm going to read them for you. One of them, the Lawrence Fairland Gate poem I'm going to read first is... Uh, uh, it's in his uh, book, published in the year 2000, called How to Paint Sunlight. Uh, the poem is called Don't Cry For Me, Indiana. <laughs> so this is Don't Cry For Me, Indiana by Lawrence Fairland Getty. I feel like I just got beamed down by Scotty in Star Trek. What is this place? Indianapolis? 2000? Out of the sky, I got dreamed down into the Omni Severn Hotel. Attached to huge shopping mall, all in clothes. All the products of corporate monoculture shipped in from somewhere else. Welcome, says the fancy brochure, to fabulous fashion, delightful diversions. Distinct shops entice you to create a new look. Delicate treats tempt you at each and every turn. Opportunities to relax and refresh your spirits abound. With ample parking and enclosed walkways. All for sale, including a three-foot plaster Venus de Milo, only $3,229. Uh, 
A $1,339 suede jacket persuades me not. A huge window full of styrofoam beasts. A huge window full of styrofoam breasts covered by flaming red lace ears. Promise of pneumatic bliss. Citizens walk by, panting. Where are the fringed buckskin shirts in the country of Lincoln's boyhood? Where are the Indians in Indianapolis? Where are the Granger movement, the Greenback Party, the Populist Party? Where are Eugene V. Debs when we need him? Middletown, swept away, all over Middle America, the same scene. Mom and pop neighborhoods boarded up. Don't cry for me, Indiana. I've got it made in the Omni Severin Hotel. Happy men and women in straight suits walking around with cell phones. National headquarters of the American Legion still just around the corner. But Indian territory ain't Indian anymore. They rounded up the Indians and told them there aren't enough of them to be called Indians anymore. They fell among the fallen timbers. They were tipped over at Tippecanoe. I'm an alien fallen into this strange land. I came looking for you, Indiana. And what did I find? The settlers are gone, Indiana. And a new breed of pioneers has taken over. Out the seventh floor hotel window, I see the shining cars coming over the horizon. Covered wagons buried long ago on the, on the banks of the Wabash far away. I hear the cries of the cattlemen in the dusk. The roundup is in full swing. I head out into it in search of the heart of America. Oh, who's your state? Who's your state? A hotel black man dressed like an admiral holds the door open for me. Where away? So that's, that was Don't Cry For Me, Indiana by Lawrence Fairley Getty that he uh, wrote while in Indiana in the year 2000. Uh, this is my response to it that I wrote at the time. Uh, this was actually published in uh, uh, Bloomington Weave, uh, no, uh, uh, Linda Weave of Bloomington Poets, an anthology that I believe was published in 2002. So we're talking about ancient history. Uh, but this, so this was written in the year 2000. This was uh, this was sort of a response to uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti's poem. This is called "Indiana Cries for You Every Goddamn Night." Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and don't you forget it. <laughs> Sitting against a concrete column in Clues Hall, chin on one knee. Turned awkwardly toward stage to hear Ferlinghetti read poems in 80 year old Burl Ivesian beatnik lilt, lifting satorial simplicity out of doggerel pen of posy into a murky atmosphere of teenaged English majors dying slow of ennui and lucky star old timers jumping at the word cock in, among American haikus. On stage, Big Sur muses on five ladies' stockings, falling softly to the floor, turning him on like shiny candies in store windows beneath pink awnings on Coney Island. The fire that consumed Neil and Jack still smolders within him. You can hear it crackle. So sad, his poetic impression of Indiana, hermetically sealed monocultural mall. Things would have been different had he read at Soma. We put him up in Grant Street Inn, plop him down by stained reflecting pools at Sanders Quarry with notebook and pen, share copious bowls of sweet, skunky, wholesome, homegrown herb on courthouse steps round midnight, and contemplate the Indiana theater sign on a Broadway amid cornfields. Meanwhile, you're rapping with Julia about your past, our unsettling present, the ever-hungry future, and reverent tones that only you can hear, heavenly, should be scrunched right next to me in hard, cold alcove, straining to hear through a flaccid PA, relying on plywood acoustics and faith to clear the context of any perseverating black Monday maudlin obfuscation. 
John leans over and says he likes wine, two tiki's tilted. And I nod, make traditional Japanese grunt of a scent. Mm. Imagine strolling with Heather Lee through garden debris of home, squash blossom web now devoid of tendrils folded up against the barn to make room for our home improvement. Man, it might snickers like a kid, standing on tiptoe on soapbox, still unmoved by obscenity cases of banned books swinging under dusty city lights, uncontent with love poet glory of the hit 1967, still complaining about the state of the world, but having a good time. Yeah, sing out. See why you treat these cypress trees of love. And pretending Edward Hopper even cared that his subjects were more depressed than he. Heather Lee waiting up for me when I get home, weary from the twice lost trip to no place. I have been more exhausted than this, on the road and off. But I am still burning, fantasizing, introducing Lawrence to your mom. Hell, there's a spare futon upstairs you can crash on. In the morning, he'll decline stern coffee, trudging out through new bed of fresh laid septic finger system, plowed right smack through the middle of the garden, and on into disgorged pile of rocks, once holiest hell of all fire pits, to walk the land in hand sewn hemp sandals, and upon returning, gesturing beyond a tangle of sticks and strings upside a painful old barn, would ask, What's all this about? And I just jerk my weary thumb in your direction, because this poem is going nowhere, baby. And that tale would be better told by you. Thank you. Um, so this is, a, this is a brand new piece. Um, well, it's uh, from March, from late March. Um, I'm going to run it. Uh, I had an opportunity to do some in-person readings in Indianapolis during Final Four. I actually got to read uh, poetry readings uh, in the public sphere um, during uh, during March Madness up there in uh, Indianapolis. An interesting choice of venues. Um, but this is... Um, I mean, you don't know her, and she's not here, so I'll go ahead and say it. She hasn't heard it yet, but this one's about my mom. This is called Hoosiers Ain't Real. <laughs> jump ball, jump ball, get it, get it. Jump ball, jump ball, get it, get it. Jump ball, jump ball, get it, get it. Jump ball, jump ball, get it. Eleanor is dating again at 82, so watch the fouls, boys. Watch the elbows, watch the hands. No stutter step lifting a pivot foot in the paint. No excessively aggressive offensive picks that'll get you fouled out. Jump ball, jump ball, get it, get it. Jump ball, jump ball, get it. Warren was in her possession for 57 years, and she owned that game it took his lifetime to master. Their first date was basketball. The Milan miracle of 54 on the radio at Mary Lou's place while they blew spitballs and made goo eyes at each other from across the room. Little Milan, slinging all they had against giant Muncie Central, an epic defensive battle up and down the court, tied in the final 13 seconds. Tied! Stood still. Eleanor fell in love with Warren in his leather jacket, driving that 54 Blue Ford Coupe. She waited four quarters to get a seat next to him and took her shot. Time in! Ball inbounds past the body plump, who runs, out, uh, runs down the clock, then makes his move and sinks a 14-foot buzzer beater for the win. Warren and Eleanor make their move. But sweet victory is a moment that doesn't last. To get to the big dance, you gotta burn and yearn to earn it. Jump ball, jump ball, get it, get it. Jump ball, jump ball, get it. Warren dumped Ellen in 56, so she gave the nod to Larry Burnett, who ran the grocery store. Her rebound for a month till Warren came back around, finally hitched in 58. A lifetime of putting up with it ensued. An embrace of decades of ordinary kids and family feuds, her mad money plays on a better life, his 
growing older and cold shoulder, working, always working too hard, too tired to give a damn. From all stars in each other's eyes to bench warmers carrying each other's water, dour and dutiful in the twilight, not without love, but not enough. We war and died in 15, Eleanor went back to fundamentals. Old Larry, still alive, still living in the same tiny town as she, hopeful to recapture glory days, but dating is a patient old school game of pass, 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 shoot. Zone when what you want is one on one. And the single online date Eleanor tried live about his age. 85, not 72, as advertised. And Larry expects her to listen, not contribute to conversation. Take his direction when she's driving, and they still wind up lost. At least he pays for parking. Pass, pass, pass. Warren would never even let her drive. Shoot. 57 years of that shit, too. Jump ball, jump ball, get it, get it. Jump ball, jump ball, get it. Eleanor's dating again, boys, at 82. So watch the fouls, watch the elbows, watch the hands. No stutter step lifting a pivot put in a paint. No excessively aggressive offensive picks that'll get you fouled out. The movie Hoosiers isn't true. Based on something real, love is not the waiting game. Dating wins. Impossible to give 110% when you've given a lifetime of giving it all. When you're hot, you're hot. When you're cold, you're cold. And if you're lucky, you're lucky you get to give anything at all. Jump ball, jump ball, get it, get it. Jump ball, jump ball, get it. Thanks, audience. How are you guys doing out there? Awesome. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a couple of fairly many things, and then I'm going to read something brand new out of my journal. We'll see if I, we'll see if I can actually read it, and then I'm going to finish with a poem. So we've got four more to deal with. Here. So this is um, one of the last things I did before the big lockdown last year. Was I spent. Um, Part of November and all of December in um, uh, Whidbey Island, Washington, uh, doing some theater work. And a good friend of mine gave me a Lawrence Fairley Getty chapbook while I was out there, which was fantastic. And, and um, so, on, uh, so I wanted to read something from this that, uh, that I, uh, I did a reading um, right before shutdown. Um, and I kind of, you know, you know how you get, you get gifts sometimes, especially if it's a book and you don't read it immediately. Well, I didn't read it immediately. I kind of tucked it away and then I sort of rediscovered it during the, during the shutdown. And I really like this one. And I, again, I wrote kind of a response to it. So we're going to get... Lawrence Fairley did his poem first and had my response to it afterwards. So this is called uh, Pity the Nation, and it's got a little uh, epigraph at the beginning. Pity the Nation after Camille Gibran. Pity the Nation, whose people are sheep and whose shepherds mislead them. Pity the Nation, whose leaders are liars, whose sages are silenced, and whose bigots haunt the airwaves. Pity the nation that raises not its voice, but aims to rule the world by force and by torture, and knows no other language but its own. Pity the nation whose breath is money and sleeps the sleep of the too well fed. Pity the nation, oh, pity the people of my country, my country, tears of thee, sweet land of liberty. Thank you on behalf of Lord Strand Day. So and this was my so this is less of a response than the other one was. This was sort of um, 
a, a postscript maybe. So this is this is called Pity for Sale. I wrote this during the lockdown last year. Uh, I think probably around this time last year I wrote this. So this is called Pity for Sale after Fairland Getty after DeBron. Pity for sale. Pity the bee who has no country. Its fuzzy, swollen appetite and hardwired love of candy. Pity the window, gladly accepting so many waves of heat and hand, fogged with condensation of desire. Pity the vegetable in its untouchable packet, disguised as itty bitty seeds that are mere possibilities. Pity the failed backup and make it new. Pity the ambulance so lonely it stalks my next door neighbor twice this year alone. Alone. Pity the billionaires in love with zeros. No, fuck those clowns, write him a zero. Pity the worker who identifies with a king. Pity the tree dragged down by sweet honeysuckle, the red buds picking the woods, telling us it is time. Time. Pity the time it takes to feel, the time it takes to unfeel, to unlearn, to unlove, to unseal. Pity our ranks and forms, a slot for everyone where we all would be better off marked other. My country, tis not insane, but copes horrendously. Sweet land, sweet liberty. Ask in busy be. Two more. And as Bill Huffley pointed out, I do have books for sale if you're interested in. Um, nothing I read tonight is in them, but there's some really good, there's some really good primo stuff in there. Probably better stuff if you really want to get into it. And but not no Lawrence Fairley Getty. So and those are not. I will sell you Lawrence Fairley Getty's books. So this is a this is a pantoum that is untitled. And this was I'm doing a thirty and thirty, uh, which a lot of you poet types might do thirty and thirty. But thirty and thirty is what you do during National Poetry Month, which is this month. Um, where you write a poem a day for the month of April. And I've, been, I've been doing 30 and 30 uh, twice a year, actually. I do it in November, too. Yes, that's when that's when novelists do NaNoWriMo and try to write a novel in the month of November. I'm like, I'm not writing a novel, but I'll write some more poems. So I do, I do poem a day in April and November, and I've been doing that since uh, 2005. So, um, so we're going to try this. This is a pantoum with no title, and uh, my handwriting is not that fantastic, so we'll see, we'll see how this works. Shoveling the earth for you gave off immaculate sense, the part with the tree everyone secretly resents. Gave off immaculate sense, wind took away, everyone secretly resents the wasted day. Wind took away, singing to the sun, the wasted day, someone. Singing to the sun, forbidden in the end. Someone, somewhere, makes amends. Forbidden in the end, the part with a tree, somewhere, makes amends. Shoveling the earth free. This is my last month. I think I am, I'm not legally obligated to perform this poem, but I feel morally obligated to perform this poem every opportunity I get this year. Because uh, I wrote this in 2004, the last time the 17-year cicadas came through the Midwest. Now, I don't know if you've seen a map. Uh, this, I know you've seen a map. I'm not sure if you've seen a cicada map this year, but Indiana is completely covered for um, for cicadas this year. The snow might slow them down a little bit, actually, but they're, gonna, they're coming. They're going to be here. Trust me. They were really bad in 2004. I remember in uh, parts of Bloomington, 
Um, I saw a woman running down the sidewalk doing this to keep them out of her hair. It was like a horror movie. Dogs snapping out of the air. Um, there was actually some guy, uh, last time this guy was uh, uh, in Bloomington, he was sauteing them in some butter, and he, 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 was, you know, he was trying to like, eat them as an alternative protein source, but he had a shellfish allergy and didn't know that cicadas are in the crustacean family. Who here learned something tonight? You're welcome. So I, I wrote a love song for the cicadas. This is called Cicada Blues, chorus 10 and 17. Ooh, love to love you, baby. Ooh, love to love you, baby. Ooh, love to love you, baby. I will come back for you, baby. Maybe 17 years from tonight, but I will come for you. Up from the ground through a hole this big, and I'll crawl. I'll crawl across the lawn, baby. Drag my freshly hatched ass over sidewalks and quiet city streets just to get you to come to me. I'll climb the most convenient tree I find and shed this hard, crusty exterior and back out of my people state. But when I'm dry and strong enough and I unfurl my clear wings, I will call to you. 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 And I hope you'll hear me among the million brothers in this humble acre alone vying for your attention and that you'll come to me. Come to me now, baby. Please don't make my soul wait in the cold ground another 17 long years. Come land on my beach branch and we'll make sweet butt-to-butt -butt love and place our progeny within the spent sapling soil of pulp under a heavy haze of June on a long-lost Indiana afternoon and then together we'll die. <laughs> Thank you. Hitchcock is coming out with a new movie. You know, birds, birds, just <laughs> <laughs>